feel like Big D is like the CEO of Shat, and he's holding back on us here. Like, why don't I have a candy jar and a masseuse, Big D? Because mm-hmm. we're not fucking like wag. We're not big time yet. We don't even get paid. I would just take a paycheck. I don't need a candy jar. I'll give, give me you fucking money. M&Ms. Fine. You guys, you, you want a budget for M&Ms? I'll do that. <laughs> Can I have them only in the colors of your fingernails? <laughs> yes. Remember when we first met John McClain? Our guy picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash, Sugar, and Spice Schlafly. Hi, y'all. And Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatthemovies.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, you can check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Watchmen, Lovecraft Country, and we currently are doing American Gods Season 3. Find all that information and past episodes at ShatOnTV.com. And finally, if you would like to hang out with us live all week long, please follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, ChatTheMovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games, host watch parties, and end each week with a Shappy Hour cocktail party at 9 p.m. Eastern, Friday night. All that being said, Big D, what movie are we reviewing today? So, Gene, this week, one of our listeners, Brad N., decided to commission the 1991 coming-of-age comedy, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Well, Brad wrote in and he said, hey, Shaq crew, for this commission, and hopefully it's not my last, I chose Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. I don't recall the first time I saw this movie, but I remember watching it on cable many times and always enjoying it as a kid. Even today, any coworker asking me for a status update will get a full hearted reply of I'm right on top of that, Rose. <laughs> I had not seen the movie in several years and just recently watched it so that I could give it a full critique. Now, over the years, there have been a few movies that I would classify as polarizing among the Shack crew. These movies fall somewhere between two and four average wipes, but the individual wipe scores are separated by at least one wipe each. Among these films, Big D gave the highest wipe score to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Spaceballs, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and you guessed it, Tommy Boy. These are arguably in my top 25 movies, judge as you may, except maybe for Spaceballs. Conversely, there are five polarizing movies where Big D gave the lowest wipe score. Armageddon, The Last Boy Scout, Halloween, Revenge of the Nerds, and Magnolia. None of which I would go out of my way to watch, but I might watch if it's already playing. Maybe except for Armageddon. Again, don't judge. But overall, I've come to the conclusion that Big D and I are just fundamentally different in our definitions of enjoyable, nostalgic, and guilty pleasure movies. And I'm okay with that. So do your worst with this one, Big D. I'm ready for it. On a more serious note, I want to thank you again for the many hours of entertainment you have provided me and the rest of the audience. Please know that your dedication to the fans and the art form does not go unnoticed. And I am thankful and humbled to be able to support your work. Much love and respect to Big D, Gene, Ash, and all the Shack crew. Sincerely, Brad N. Now, Brad pointed out that he and Big D are fundamentally different. Brad, you don't know how alike you two are because Big D about a year ago was looking at all the Shat scores and he's like, you know what? I noticed a variance where some of us gave really high <laughs> scores and low scores to certain things. So if you go to shatthemovies.com slash rankings, you can literally see where Big D added a column called A, which is the average of the highest and lowest wipe score, which he felt would be like a mitigating factor to calm the wild oscillations and scores on certain movies. So, Brad, you two might be of the same mind. 
Uh, yes, Gene, I actually took it a step further because I found that <laughs> doing the average of the highest and the lowest score tended to be inaccurate. So I did the average of the highest in the middle, the average of the lowest in the middle, and then averaged those out. <laughs> so there is like it is a, a phantom fourth vote that should balance it out. If two people, if two hosts love a movie and the other person pulls like a big D and says, no, you know, Spaceballs a five, the two people who had lower scores, it should weight it and it has shifted slightly. And I will apologize. I I've said this before, Brad and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I think I let the tension between Roger and I bleed into that recording. So I think I was unfair there. And Spaceballs, I think I will give a chance again. But other than that, I think I, I stand by my votes. Listening to you explain that makes me feel like when I'm listening to people explain baseball stats, and I'm like, <laughs> the, the fucking what now? Yeah. It's the only way to make baseball interesting. <laughs> well, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead is a 1991 coming-of-age black comedy film starring Christina Applegate, Joanna Cassidy, Josh Charles, and David Duchovny. The plot focuses on 17-year-old Sue Ellen Krendel, who becomes head of the house when the babysitter her mother hired suddenly dies in her sleep. Although only a moderate success theatrically, the film later achieved a cult following on VHS and cable television. Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead was released in theaters on June 7th, 1991 and grossed $25.1 million on a budget of $10 million. It received generally negative reviews from critics, and because of its twisted message, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, whoever they are, chose Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead for one of the worst films of 1991. Now, Ash, Big D, I have no history with this movie, but I know both of you have seen at least part of it. Big D, we'll start with you. What are your memories of Don't Tell Mom, The Babysitter's Dead? So I was a senior when this came out, and I had never gotten past the first 30 minutes of the movie. I, I don't know why that is. And I was thinking, I was like, this is very much like Adventures in Babysitting, besides the fact that they both have babysitting, but the movies are similar. So I was like, okay, I should have seen it, but that was three years earlier. So I think if this had come out a little bit earlier, I would have been into it, but I had never seen past the first 30 minutes. I kind of lost my interest, but Christina Applegate from Married with Children was definitely like a heartthrob, somebody who had given me many teenage dreams, but this movie did not grasp me enough to actually sit down and watch it completely. Yeah, I was very different. I watched this movie so many times growing up. I don't remember the first time I saw it. I was probably like 10 or 11. But, you know, from that stretch through a lot of my teenage years, I watched this a good bit. I loved Christina Applegate in it. I think I probably wanted my own fast food employee for a boyfriend because of this movie. Um, I wanted to work as a secretary, you guys, because I thought I'd get to wear cool clothes and be grown up and that people would respect me. And I just loved everything about it. And I was really excited when this one came up in the queue because we were going to get to watch it. I was nervous about the two of you and your reactions to it, but I was pretty stoked about it. Big D, you mentioned how Adventures in Babysitting and Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter is Dead have such similar titles. And Adventures in Babysitting we have covered on the podcast. And so I, for years, I think probably until the last couple of years, didn't realize that these were two different movies. And in fact, Ash let me know that it was on HBO Max. So I went to watch it and I typed in babysitting and then Adventures in Babysitting came on and I clicked on it. And then I saw the cover of the movie. I go, God, this looks a lot like a movie we've already done. <laughs> Guys, I think 200 movies around about there is where our brains start to break, where we just can't tell the difference between movies anymore. We're like, oh, the babysitting movie with the girl. I've seen it. That's where we are. Well, on that note, Big D, let's hit the trailer. When's your mom leaving for Australia? Oh, in about an hour and a half. She's leaving you guys all alone. I'm getting rid of her for two whole months. I can go to the beach. I can stay out as late as I want. I can do anything. I'm a free woman. <laughs> Hello, dear. I'm Mrs. Stewart. I'm a babysitter. What? All right, you little maggots, now line up. Are you serious? I'll make your summer a living hell. Oh, hey! TV rocks your brain. It's time we let her know the rules. Yeah, we outnumber her. Let's kick some butt. Mrs. Sturak. Mr. Eck? Oh, my God. 
She died in her sleep. They'll probably blame us. Hey, be careful. I got her. No, I mean my skateboard. Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. Rock and roll! Now, Christina Applegate and her brother... What? ...bounce back for a summer with... Have my baby. No rules. In your dreams, babe. No curfews. No nagging. No pulse. Oh, how you doing, Mom? No, Mrs. Durack's not here. She, um, she went to the yarn store. So, what do you guys want for breakfast? Cheese omelet. SpaghettiOs. Breakfast is served. Mow the lawn today, and don't forget to do the dishes, okay? Ah! Dishes are done, man. Don't tell Mom the babysitter's dead. Sue Ellen Krendel, played by Christina Applegate, is a 17-year-old high school graduate in Los Angeles. When her mom goes on a vacation to Australia, Sue Ellen looks forward to an entire summer of freedom with her siblings. Twin slacker and stoner Kenny, played by Keith Coogan, 14-year-old ladies' man Zach, 13-year-old tomboy Melissa, and 11-year-old TV fanatic Walter. Their mom hires a live-in babysitter, Mrs. Sturak. As soon as Mrs. Krendel leaves, Mrs. Sturak shows her true colors as an evil tyrant and then dies of a heart attack. The children drop her off at a funeral home and keep her car, but soon discover their summer spending money was left on Sturak's corpse. Okay, so when we go back and revisit these movies, you have to understand, we're at a different point in our life. When I would have watched this back in 91, I would have sided with the kids. Now as an adult... I find myself seeing things that I never would have seen before. She is a shitty fucking mom. The mom is the major villain in this movie. (laughs) I find myself, I'm looking at the house. There's no grass. It's dirt. The inside is filthy. It looks like a hoarder's episode. I'm starting to get like anxious watching it. There's food left out. It looks run down. There's piles of newspapers on the stairs. There's laundry. There's trash. Stoner Kenny is getting D's. And Swell says, Mom, you got to talk to him. Oh, it's an improvement. What can I say to him? Child Protective Services should have been called on this family. I really I really think it should. I wish you guys could see Big D's recording environment right now. If you could look into his home, there are white bins, sterile <laughs> white bins with everything organized neatly inside of them. The wall behind him, white. All the doors, white. He's got cable organizers all over his desk he will send us photos in slack of like look at this new organization scheme mm-hmm. can you imagine this? his yard immaculate there will be a fucking hurricane in florida and like the grass isn't a millimeter off big d this is a human woman she has five <laughs> kids no help like my mom after my dad died was like i got three kids and i have to have a job i'm not dating i have no time for romance you got to make decisions this woman clearly is a romantic she wants to go to australia with her boyfriend who has time to take care of the kids i I don't disagree she's got so many kids i mean we've only got two and our house looks a mess all the time and we have someone who comes in and helps to clean like but the time period in between her not being there like i call it the golden 12 hours where when they leave our house looks normal and then you know 12 hours after that i it looks exactly like it did before she came. And and I, I'm sorry, what do you expect her to do with Kenny? You want her to beat him? I mean, no, I think when you have five kids, you just got to accept that one out of the five being an asshole and being a slacker, you're still winning in terms of percentages there. And you just kind of let it go. No, you guys are fucking missing it. She has five helpers. She's not fucking alone. No. These are not five infants. She's got five able-bodied children that she could delegate jobs to. Hmm. I'm, I'm telling Ooh. you, like, oh, I know that people are gonna say it's the military. Like Vanessa sometimes says, hey, Sergeant, you know, Sergeant Dick, <laughs> can you please back down tonight? Is it better? No, no, that's, that's different. <laughs> she says it when I'm trying to, because Emma has, she has chores. She has things she has to do, right? I don't expect her to be like alphabetizing her books or putting things together by color, but clean up at the end of the day. She knows if she leaves her toys out on the floor, the donation fairy will come at night and pick them up and they will get donated. Because if she leaves things on the floor in the living room, it tells me she doesn't love them enough to actually put them away. Wow. I mean, Finn has chores, but I don't know. No, but, I think, and just I, think so I have I the fun house. Mail. Just so I don't get hate mail. The donation fairy has actually only made it to the donation place once. There's usually a day grace period where she can make up for it. 
And yesterday she made up for it. She cleaned her room. So the donation fairy made the toys reappear. Is one of her chores painting your fingernails? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm glad you noticed. Unfortunately, this wasn't kids nail paint. This is actually real stuff. So I, I, that's why it's still on today. Well, I, I think that this poor mom, I think you're giving her a really hard time. And I have to tell you guys, the worst moment of this movie for me was at the very beginning when they look at her and they're like, the ki- one of the kids looks at her and says something along the lines of, you know, like, why are you going? And she says, well, I've had 37 years on this earth and I'm tired. And I went, what? She's fucking 37. Y'all, I'm 37. I started to panic because she looked like she was closer to 50 than she was to 40. And I I mean, you guys are my friends. You all love me. And do I look this old? Do I look this tired at 37? Okay, so Conchetta Tomei, who plays Mrs. Crandall, was in her mid 40s when they filmed this movie so you're absolutely right she's closer to 50 than she is to you know 37 uh i wouldn't say you look old but like do you look tired we all look tired (laughs) people don't realize some of some people join us on shappy hour and they can actually look at us but for those of you who can't see us every time we get on here it's like the walking dead on screen we all look like death everyone's got rings around their eyes we're like slumping in our chairs usually somebody like minimum one usually three of us have just gotten out of the shower it's a uh, yeah, it's a it's a labor of love. Yeah, I found myself thinking she looked young. <laughs> As you get older, <laughs> your, your 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 gauge of I was like I was like thirty seven. She's maybe thirty one, maybe twenty eight, somewhere in that Jesus. range. I couldn't tell it, but I, I can't let you guys skate on this whole thing about the mom. The kids need some discipline. Mrs. Sturak, she's great. She comes in and right away she says, I think in the description, Gene, you said that she is a a tyrant. She's a terrible person. What does she want them to do that's so terrible? Hey, turn off the TV, go read, write me a report on an aardvark. She tells Walter, stop hooking up in the car. You're a kid. That's not what you should be doing right now. Tomorrow, we're going to clean the garage. She makes a nice chart where everyone has their jobs for the week. They're learning responsibility. The kids, they need more Mrs. Sturrocks and Mr. Hand. If they had some form of discipline and responsibility, the world would be a better place and their home would be a better place. She's gruff. She takes no shit. And you're absolutely right, Big D. She's not wrong. Like she's not. Everything she's saying is valid. No, I I, I think I have a problem where I go right back to being 16 and I'm like, you can't tell me what to do. Like, stop telling those kids what to do. You're not my mom. Like, I totally get the kids reaction to that. And it's not like she's nicely like, hey, guys, we're going to take on some responsibility this summer. I mean, she throws an Encyclopedia Britannica at the kid who knows if he can even read and she sends him to his room. I mean, she's a bitch. She's terrible. No, you are a participation mom. Are you the one who's going to give the kids all the, the, hey, you did a great job. You're playing. Look at what the way these kids have been raised has done. Not one of these kids has respect for a dead old lady. None of them feels guilty. They're joking about chopping her head off as they stuff her in the trunk of a car. They're tearing through her room and her personal belongings like a pack of animals looking for money. They take this deceased woman's vintage car out joyriding to go to Chuck E. Cheese. Can you at least admit that whatever they were doing in the upbringing, it has not created a normal, normal child? Wrong. These kids were charming. I want to hang out with these kids. I'm like, they're they're like, yeah, we should chop around. Maybe we should measure her body. I'm like, yeah, I mean, fucking this is cool. Like, I want to hang out with you guys. I'm in for it. So I think we're having a repeat of like clerks here where like Big D has his like Carl from up moments where like he turns into like that get off my lawn kind of guy because I think you've forgotten what it's like to be this age. I thought it was actually super realistic that kids like this, they they wouldn't have thought about long term consequences. They're not thinking about the effects of her being dead. They're not thinking about, you know her family somewhere maybe that she has. I know that she told him she doesn't have family, but you know, maybe somebody wants to know she's dead. And I think that this is a lot better than those asshole kids and adventures of babysitting that are afraid of homeless people at the bus stop. I think this is much more accurate with what kids like actually are, are like. And, and to answer your question, no, I am not a participation mom, but I think there's a big divide here from giving all the kids ribbons for doing, you know, all the things and just, 
just letting kids be fucking kids sometimes. And my kid today at HEB wouldn't say thank you to the cupcake lady and look like a total asshole. I mean, like it happens. These kids are cool. I mean, I'm starting to realize one thing, and that's that stoners in all these movies are like the coolest people, right? So Spicoli and Fast Times, Kenny and his crew, and Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. I'm watching them hanging out in the truck, and they're all like wearing their leather jackets and listening to metal. I'm like, these guys are fucking cool. They're having a good time. They got a sweet truck. They're like hitting on girls but not being gross about it. And I mean, yeah, sometimes they steal from their parents and use their credit cards and they drink underage. But like I would hang out with them. And as for the trunk incident, Big D, you're talking about how it's some like malevolent action of some psychopath kids. I thought it was a pretty decent extension of the fact that like they're kind of innocent and kind of cute as kids. Like, what do you do with a dead old lady? Like, you want to get blamed for it. You could get in trouble, I think. And the trunk solution, I did not see coming at all. I was watching the screen like, what's going to happen next? And the last thing I expected was a trunk on the steps of a funeral home with a sign on it that said, nice old lady inside, died of natural causes, <laughs> which which like both gives a modicum of respect by calling her a nice old lady and simultaneously absolves them from all wrongdoing because clearly she died of natural causes. Right. They could have been honest. They could have been like tyrant, you know, authoritarian <laughs> bitch inside, but they didn't. And, and all of that being said, I mean, I don't think that Sue Ellen's mom is a bitch, but I also don't know how she does what she does to get this plot started because – I get the desire to go on vacation without your children. There is nothing more glorious than going on vacation without your children sometimes. You know, we do that at least once per year, and then we do one with them too. So so that's fine. Go on a vacation for a week, maybe two, but two months? You leave your kids for two months? I think that I, I'm just sitting here thinking practically, like, how much fucking money are you having to leave behind for them? Because this vacation is now not just the cost of going to Australia, but it's also the cost of keeping your kids alive at home. So I don't know about you, Big D, but when we leave our kids with other people, they're nightmares when we come back because their routine's completely off. Like they've been spoiled. They've been given whatever they want. Could you do this? I don't know if legally you can do this. Could (laughs) I do it? I was talking to you before we started recording that last weekend, Vanessa and I, we went up to New York, the two of us for three days. It was the first time in Emma's five years of life that we've been away from her. And after about the first five hours, Vanessa and I looked at each other and we're like, this is this is kind of weird. I said, what, what, what is this? It was we had forgotten what it was like to be dating, to be alone, to be able to just do whatever you want. So, no, two months you couldn't do. And it was great to come back and see her. But this is something we're going to do more of. But I could never go away for two months. I. I don't even, I I don't think you can do it. I mean, I don't even have kids. I have a dog and I can't even vacation without the dog. You know, it's like, it's, I can't even imagine fucking a kid alone, five kids alone for two months. It's, it's ridiculous. And I'm starting to see Big D's point here. Maybe instead of going to Australia for two months, if you're going to take two months off, take two months off, stay at home, fix your fucking house. Yeah, Get your kids in order. Like maybe that would be a good thing to do. And it kind of drives me to the point of there's a difference between vacation and travel as well. Like if you're traveling, yeah, you don't want to take kids because you want to go see a bunch of shit. You don't have to accommodate them. But vacation is different. Vacation is fucking is chilling, right? Like I, I think there's a distinction between the two. And if you're vacationing, you should have your family around. Otherwise, as Big D kind of intimated, you hate your family because if right. chill time, you don't want to spend your family. Yeah. You're kind of an asshole. Right. We take our kids somewhere within four to five hours of us because that's an easy travel. And it's wonderful. Like we make great memories. I love being with my children on those trips. But like when we go to like Hawaii, my worst nightmare is flying for six hours with two children. So I think there's adult things and there's kid things. But I miss my kids after I have a 48 hour thing where after 48 hours, I'm ready to get back to them. And I can't imagine dealing with that on the other side of the world, you know, know 60 days in no not unless you want to be away and i think what totally reveals the the nature of their relationship when they're planning what to do with the body they're like we'll go to jail and they go do you want mom to come home all the kids at once go no the thought of mom coming home was worse than the thought of them going to jail so that tells you how the mom is they're teenagers i wouldn't wanted my mom to come home either and i love my mom 
I mean, she's so old. <laughs> I love my yeah, mom. She looks like a hag. You don't want that hag around. Hey, you like her blouses. Well, Sue Ellen finds work at a fast food restaurant called Clown Dog. Despite a budding relationship with her coworker Brian, played by Josh Charles, she quits because of the obnoxious manager, Mr. Egg. Sue Ellen forges a resume and applies at General Apparel West. Company executive Rose Lindsay finds her resume so impressive that she offers Sue Ellen a job as an executive assistant, much to the chagrin of Carolyn, played by Jane Brooke, a receptionist who was initially in line for the job. While the kids have dinner at a Chuck E. Cheese's, Mrs. Sturak's car is stolen by drag queens, forcing Sue Ellen to call in a favor from Brian to bring them home. So it's become no surprise on the pod that I typically was way into like the alt girls, like the alternative girls of the 90s. I mean, Winona Ryder, obviously. I know she's not in movies, but Shirley Manson, the lead singer of Garbage, I absolutely was obsessed with. Claire Danes' character, Angela Chase, and My So-Called Life. Like, those are the girls that I loved and became like style icons for me. But Christina Applegate, even though she's pretty mainstream, she's so damn beautiful. Like even when she's wearing those ridiculous, like I'm a working woman of the early nineties with those crazy shoulder pads and those big old earrings. Like, I just think she's absolutely perfect. And I was obsessed with her hair in this movie. Like she's got so much volume in her hair and I used to have that. And for all of our young listeners, don't have babies or get COVID because that goes away. And she just, her hair is flawless. She's flawless. And I just thought she was amazing to look at. Totally agree. Christina Applegate is stunning in this. And I think it revealed how underutilized she was in Married with Children as Kelly Bundy, or it might show how good she was at playing Kelly Bundy because growing up, all I knew Christina Applegate was Kelly Bundy, which was like this vapid, airheaded, you know, blonde ditz. And and I want to say that you keep saying stunning, both of you. I think there's a difference to it. She's natural. She is the type of beautiful high school girl that I could have hoped to find. There's nothing artificial. And and I know it's we're talked about adventures and babysitting, but her and Elizabeth Shue. They seem like somebody you could have known, somebody who was realistic, and it was a nice change from the Hollywood made up plastic female leads you would get a lot. Fuck, dude. I went to I wish I went to your high school. Oh, in my dreams. <laughs> what, I was people dreaming. look like that. <laughs> I said potentially she could. Possibly. Now, in this job that she has in Clown Dog, she works for this manager, Mr. Egg. And like we see this in a lot of 80s and 90s high school movies. There's the wacky manager at the fast food place that you have to work for. And yeah, Mr. Egg stands way too close to Swell. He's just up on her all the time. But Swell doesn't seem creeped out by how close she stands to her. She's more like annoyed with how enthusiastic he is. And I felt bad for Mr. Egg. I feel like he was just like an eccentric dude. And I used to work at Arby's. And I would have loved a manager like this. He's like, put on a happy face, and, you know, tell me to do weird jobs. Instead, I had Sharon. Sharon, if you're listening, owner of the Arby's on Arizona Avenue in Warner. She would say shit to me <laughs> like if I dared to lean on a counter during a break, she would say, if you got time to lean, you got time to clean. Also, Sharon, you might want to take some money and instead of having one ice maker way in the back of the store where I had to keep filling up with a bucket and then taking it to each soda dispenser throughout the restaurant, <laughs> maybe invest the extra couple hundred bucks and put an ice maker on each soda dispenser so that you can free up my time, I don't know, to clean some more. But I think it's normal. You need that manager. In Fast Times at Ridgemont High, there was the manager of Captain Hook's Fish and Chips. Very much like this. The person who's all about it. Like, hey, this is great, everybody. Let's put on our hat. Let's get our smile. That type of business doesn't work without that person. Well, it doesn't because they they believe in all that shit like unironically. It's like the guy also (laughs) in the manager in office space about the flair. Like they've totally bought into the company line. And I think she's more annoyed than creeped out. And I think that's what we're supposed to get. But I do have to say I was really blown away with some of the dialogue in this. And there's this one scene there in Clown Dog where she looks up to Josh Charles's character and she's talking about Mr. Egg, about him being so insanely happy all the time. And she says, did he just finish reading dialogue? 
Dianetics or something. And I was like, holy shit, like, was that just a Scientology joke? I, I guess I was wrong. I thought Scientology with like the Leah Remini and like Cuckoo Kachu, like Tom Cruise. Like, I thought that that was, you know, the Scientology movement. But was this a thing in the early 90s? I'm kind of embarrassed about how much I know about Scientology because this shit peaked <laughs> in like the 70s, Ash. They had at one point, they said 6 million members. I think the actual number that was like figured out by most experts is like 2 million. But yeah, in the 70s, I mean, think about Scientology. It's about as 70s a religion as you could get. Now, this has triggered memories that I had. There used to be TV commercials about the book, and I can remember it was like the volcano erupting. <laughs> and it was like, it was like, get your life in order. Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard. I didn't even know it was religion. The whole time I thought it was like a, a self-improvement book, like a, a philosophy about how to find inner peace and how to how to balance your chakras and get your zen in line. I didn't even know it was a religion until recently. So that shit was everywhere. And you kind of thought that people who read it would make you happy. But that's like the ideas that you get from fucking these commercials. And, and the movie on a whole seemed like it was written by kids and kids idea of the real world. It wasn't cynical. And I love that. But there's so many little bullshit nuggets that you could tell this was what a kid's idea of the real world is. When she says, I think it's like her first week. And Brian asks her out on the date, and she's like, okay, we'll go after work. And in my mind, I'm thinking, bullshit. She works in downtown LA. She lives in, quote, the boonies. So I'm like, how long is it going to take from her to get to work, come home, take a nice long bath, yell at her brothers, then go out? That's not how commuting works. She would have gotten home at like 830 and been beat tired. And then her boss has this room with a changing like screen and a full makeup station. I'm like, that doesn't happen. Three grand in petty cash. Nope, that doesn't happen. I'm going to work extra hours. You're salaried. That's not how it works. I think the movie earned this, though, by setting up Rose as a very extra character. So Rose is the executive that Sue Ellen ends up working for. And like she clearly she looks like a fancy orangutan or something. But she's like <laughs> she is very like she's just very extra. And so it actually to me it seems like Rose would have an office where she had a dressing station and three thousand dollars in petty cash. But I don't think kids wrote this movie. I think my mom wrote this movie because my mom, <laughs> when I moved back to Arizona, I was like, okay, mom, I got a couple of recruiters lined up. They're going to, you know, shop around, see what jobs kind of fit my skill set, blah, blah, blah. She's like, no, no, no. Here's what you do. Just go to anywhere you want to work and go in the door and you say, hello, I am Jean and I want this job. And they will see you are so smart and they will hire you. And I'm like, yeah, mom, that's not really how fucking jobs work, but. Good luck writing your script. Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. That's so sweet. But I, I do have to say, I worked for a lobbying firm in D.C. for a hot minute. And we had a room with a masseuse in it that people could Damn. go to. There was a room with extra clothes for all the executives in case they spilled something on themselves. Like, it was mega, mega money. So I feel like if they make enough money, I don't think that this is so, like, insanely out of character. Yes, Gene. I feel like Big D is like the CEO of Shat, and he's holding back on us here. Like, why don't I have a candy jar and a masseuse, Big D? Because mm -hmm. we're not fucking like wag. We're not big time yet. We don't even get paid. I would just take a paycheck. I don't need a candy jar. I'll give, give me you fucking m &Ms. Fine. You guys, you, you want a budget for M&Ms? I'll do that. <laughs> Can I have them only in the colors of your fingernails? <laughs> yes. Well, that's all of them. His fingernails are the rainbow. Um, but I do admit, though, like this, this obviously early 90s was so different in terms of getting a job than today, right? Like, I think LinkedIn and the creation of it kills a plot like this when this eventually comes around to be remade, like all 90s and 80s films. Um, I love that with just a little piece of paper, with just a little resume that she gets in. And I was thinking about my own applications for jobs, like before you applied online. And I got my first job, which was at Six Flags in New Orleans called Jazzlam. I went to a Burger King in a random part of New Orleans. And I brought this little paper resume that was pink because my mom thought it would set me apart mm -hmm. um, that I just listed on there my dance awards and my academic awards and handed it to this lady who looked at me like I was nuts for bringing a resume. And they hired me on the spot because like your mom said, they just noticed how wonderful I was. 
I hope your mother got co-writing credits with Gene's mom for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead, written by moms. But, <laughs> Ash, what kind of awards do they give out in dance? Like, I understand in sports, you could like, win a trophy and stuff. Like, is it a competitive thing or, like, a most improved? Oh, yeah. Like, No, okay. No, um, it was highly competitive. It, it is a sport. I mean, I danced all over, but you know, like I won a couple national championships. I won a couple state championships. I had lots of trophies, lots of medals, and I thought that they were super important and put them all on my resume. I think it's adorable because that would clearly set me up to be able to work as a cashier at uh, Jazzland in the photo booth. So, well, I think what your mother was trying to do was demonstrate that you have discipline, you have good rhythm. You know, you're you're responsible. <laughs> right. I've watched Dance Moms. I know how it goes. But this is like an 80s and 90s theme. Roger and I, way back in our first movie, we marveled at Josh Baskins when he lands at executive job at Macmillan Toys. <laughs> he doesn't even have a social security number. Well, and now they just like stalk your social media, right? Like that's what they do when they're looking into you. That's the world we're in. I mean, I would go back any day to applying anonymously like this than the way that we're forced to apply today. So it was a little bit of nice nostalgia. Yeah, Big D back in 91, they didn't have HR. They had personnel. (laughs) It's a big sign right there. It's on the first floor. Yeah. Before we move on, I do want to take a second to point out how wonderfully random this movie is because they threw in a scene where three drag queens dressed as Liza Minnelli, Dolly Parton, and Marilyn Monroe stole a dead old lady's car from teenagers in a Chuck E. Cheese parking lot. Like this reminds me of like the Illinois Nazis and blues brothers when there's like, I hate Illinois Nazis. Like what the fuck? But, and then they close the scene out so perfectly as, as the car is peeling off. They're like, was that Liza? <laughs> End scene. Oh, but what makes this so much better is the Nazis come back in the Blues Brothers. They keep coming back. This, they never come back again. Yeah, just a one-off. It's not like one day we see them driving by in the car and they're like, hey, there's our car. It is so random and wonderful because they just did it for that one moment. When it shows how smart Sue Ellen is, too, because they're like, should we call the cops? And she's like, and say what? Like, we stole our dead babysitter's <laughs> car. Like, it took care. It was a perfect plot device because it took care of a problem yeah. for them in the most random and beautiful way. And whoever that queen is, dressed as Liza Minnelli, like, she was beat to the gods. Like, she looked amazing. And it was like, for this one little bitty scene, they got those people probably four or five hours into drag. And it was, it was perfect. I think an excellent end of credit scene would have been like a newspaper headline that said like three drag queens arrested and missing woman's disappearance where they got caught in the car and somehow framed for the murder of Mrs. That's terrible. It it did remind me, though, that post Katrina, there was this big thing in New Orleans where there was this roving band of drag queens that were robbing stores on magazine. And I lived off of magazine on Austerlitz at the time. And like we would see them all the time. There were about six of them on bikes and they would roll up to stores and hold them up and they would take as much as they could carry on their bikes and in the baskets and then go on their (laughs) way just like this. To be fucking fair, though, if you go into a store on magazine, they're like 300 feet deep and there's always one person. And working there so i'd fucking rip them <laughs> off too well sue ellen begins stealing from petty cash at gaw to support the family intending to return it when she receives her paycheck but her siblings swipe most of the petty cash funds from her purse to buy extravagant gifts handling her career and teen life strains sue ellen's relationship with brian when she discovers that he and carolyn are brother and sister carolyn and her coworker bruce played by david duchovny repeatedly try to discredit Sue Ellen's accomplishments, but Rose views the efforts as nothing more than petty jealousy on Carolyn's part. So I can't believe I'm going to say this, but there is a cute innocence to the romance. It's believable. I could see why they would like each other. And when they have that late night Walmart date where they're bouncing around, it's fun. It's innocent. And at that moment, the movie started to turn me and I started to like be less critical and started to see what they were going for. And it was a, a, a nice surprise. You can't believe you're going to say this big D you're so fucking soft. You said the same shit on Valley girl. You're I like, know. Oh, it reminded me so much of romance and kissing in cars and just being a teen <laughs> and food fights at prom, food with, fights, with at little prom. weenies and, and 
finger sandwiches. Well, I'm going to hit you with the gene cynicism because this was the most <laughs> 90s cliche. The sweet guy gets the stressed girl to do a quirky thing in a public place. In the real world, she'd be like, get the fuck away from me and stop dismissing my real stress that I'm under. But I will give you that scene like at the pier or at the docks or whatever. Like They have that discussion of future life as teenagers. That one felt genuine to me. That's the moment where I saw some quality in the writing. Well, and I think I remember feeling that way, like not really understanding what life was like going to be like, like as a teenager, you see your your parents as adults and you don't really understand what it means to be an adult. And what I like about this movie is the way that she begins to truly get how hard adulting is, I think is also really genuine. And I don't think in all the movies I've done with y'all that I've related more to how pissed she was when she gets out of the bath and yells at Kenny and she's just like, I just want to take a fucking bath, right? I just need some quiet. And I remember as a tween and teenager thinking in my head, like, well, I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to be stressed like that. And then you cue to me at 37, where the other day my children used me as a jungle gym for two straight hours. So I came into our bathroom and we have a super shower. And I just sat with the shower on and was on my phone for like 30 minutes until the hot water ran out because I was alone. And it was the most glorious thing ever because I went to bed after and maybe I am as old as the mom in this movie because I really get it, Sue Ellen. I get it. Ash, I don't have a private lake or a solarium at my <laughs> home. <laughs> or a super What's shower? What's a super shower? A super shower where like it's like it's a big shower and okay. it's got one of like the rainfall, you know, shower heads. But then there's like a bench on the other side that you can sit on and not get wet from the shower. How big is this thing? I mean, it's not like as big as like... It is it like coming to America? Sounds. No. Vagina I mean, washer. <laughs> no, I mean, like, it's like, I don't know. It's like the size of a normal glass shower with like an extra little piece with a little bench. Could you have tea in there? Like with other people? If they got wet. Asking for a friend. If you had three <laughs> people in the shower, is it big mm-hmm. enough that two of them would not get wet? No. Okay, it's not that bad. But all four of us have been in the shower before and we all fit. Like, you know, on like those crazy mornings when you just need everybody to get wet and soap somewhere on their Ooh. body and then out. I know those. Sounds like some Scientology shit. <laughs> yeah. Getting, just getting wet. <laughs> and speaking of getting wet, uh, am I the only one who wanted to have like a three-way with David Duchovny and Jane Brooke? They both looked amazing. First of all, David Duchovny. He's one of those weird dudes who gets better with age. Like, he looked good in this, but as he gets older, like, you get to the X-Files days, he got a little bit hotter, and then now mm-hmm. he's, like, even hotter than that. Uh, but Carolyn, as a character, she has such a super sexy personality. Like, if there's anything I love about a woman, it's when they can point out an aptitude. Like, if you don't read fucking signs or can't take a fucking hint. And also seeking justice. Like, she's not wrong in this. She knows that there's a person who took her fucking job that she was lined up for with a fake resume and hasn't been doing the work. By all means, I think she's totally justified in being an asshole. I think they would have a kinky relationship. There would be some bondage, some domination, because Bruce comes into her office and is all, where's this? Where's And when she puts him in his place, he kind of likes it. So I think there could be some role playing. And I, I agree with you, Gene. This would be something I'd want to be part of. If I was Roger, I'd be like, see, actually, this is the same universe as Californication. So oh Bruce god. grows up to be David Duc- <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, Duchovny looked good. Um, but I'll tell you, I'll look good was Josh Charles. Um, I would have never, ever gone for a guy like Josh Charles's character when I was Sue Ellen's age in this movie. He was too nice. He was too stable. He didn't insult her enough because Negging worked on me when I was a teen. And I just thought, though, at, like looking at him now, I was like, oh, he's such a cutie. And I think that in general, Josh Charles, I think he's a charming actor. Um, he's always so earnest. Like think about him like in Dead Poet Society on that show, The Good Wife, which I've seen two episodes of. And he was really cute in those. I think that he's just really charming. And I think that Sue Ellen's got a really natural, like you said, Big D chemistry with him here. Much better than Nicolas Cage has with Julie and Valley Girl. Ash, far be it from me to tell you who to be attracted to, but Jesus, no. Josh Charles, (laughs) who 
clearly is a poor man's John Cusack. You know they wanted John Cusack in this movie. They just could not <laughs> yes. fucking get him. Dude, when Brian and Sue Ellen started to connect at Clown Dog, I was literally groaning out loud, no. And then she quits the job, and I was so glad we weren't going to get this mope as the lead man. But wrong. He pops back up again, and now I just want to go back and rewatch Dead Poets Society to see if Knox is like good in that movie because I remember as a kid thinking he was the fucking coolest, but now I'm not so sure. Boo. Well, when she learns that GAW is in danger of going out of business, Sue Ellen takes it upon herself to create a new clothing line, and Rose suggests holding a fashion show to exhibit their new designs. So Sue Ellen offers to host the party, convincing her siblings to help clean up the house beautify the yard and act as caterers although she manages to pull off the party it comes to an end when mrs crandall comes home early and catches sue ellen in the act forcing her to confess her lie in front of everyone okay so in my head all i could hear was you've got to put one foot in front front of the the other other. did you not think that this is the revenge of the nerds fixing the house montage We get everything compressed into this ridiculous little four minutes. They clean the house. They paint the house. They clean the pool, fill it. They do the landscaping. Kenny learns how to cook. He goes out shopping. He is now couponing. He's got time to go out and teach her how to throw a fastball and how to hit a home run. Where did all this time come from? I mean, I think the quarantine has taught me that like a lot of shit can get done if you have nothing else to do. And I think that the timeline of this, I guess it's like what? It's about a month, like considering the timeline of the film. Yeah, it is. It's a couple of weeks. No, because she comes home immediately to the kids and she says on Friday we'll be doing this. So it's the same week. Uh, They do it in a week. Well, again, I think that there's a lot of kids working there, and I thought it was cute. I think it's cute how Kenny's watching his little cooking videos and how he turns into a dad and he grows into an adult. I thought it was precious. That part, yes. Grown-up Kenny, I loved, I loved, loved. When she comes home from the long days of work, and and he's sitting there, and you can tell they're playing the typical married couple, and he's like, I worked all day on that casserole. You could have called three hours ago. I would have fed the kids, you know, and you don't even comment on the clean house. I'm loving it. And they're fighting like a, like a real old couple. And they end it in such a funny way where he's wisping the couch. And she's like, you don't have to wisp the couch. And he goes, but it needed it. I found myself laughing out loud at a movie I thought I was going to hate. And they also use like stage blocking too, where it's like, there's no need to go from the kitchen to the living room, but that's what you would do in a dramatic scene like this. I loved all of this, that, that extended couples fight. It was incredible. I think it was the highlight of the movie, but then I was so (laughs) bummed out because Kenny then like cuts his hair off and I was like, surely it's just a ponytail. No, he cut it off. He lost all of his personality. Just poof. I don't think he lost it. I think he just grows up a little bit. He's got like an mm-hmm. actual character arc here. I, I I do think if they hadn't had the scene at the end where he's talking with his friend, like at the pool, maybe you could have said that. But he's still, you know, he's still Kenny. He's just trying to get his shit together. Well, listener Nick Cobbs can point this out that if you do like using drugs and drinking and are kind of like a burnout, but you also want to have a career going into culinary school is really the way to go because every chef I know likes mm-hmm. to get fucked up and party, but still make good money. So you know that part's real. It rings true. Yeah. Well, and in this part of the movie, we get to see the actual fashion show and y'all these clothes <laughs> are so bad. I mean, okay. First of all, who would wear them? They look like, they look like a 16 year old designed them. So I guess that is accurate. But I remember also, this isn't something that aged poorly. I remember being like 12 and 13 thinking, what the fuck are these clothes? Like, I don't think they looked good then. And I still don't think they do. And can you imagine like seeing somebody like at a bar or like somebody just randomly walking by at the mall, like wearing like that nurse's outfit? I was I was more fucking infatuated with the Janet Jackson Rhythm Nation, the applets on the shoulders. Applets. What is an applet? Whatever. I don't fucking. I don't know. He's been in the military. You know, we don't wear those things. Applets, applets, whatever the fuck they are. Okay. But this is this is a line meant for like for for like teenage (laughs) girls, right? 
And she's like, a fun and sexy look for girls. <laughs> I'm like, who's marketing this? <laughs> yeah, I might have been just lost in the movie at this point because as I'm watching it, I was like, okay, they had a contract that they thought was going to go through for school uniforms, I thought. Yeah, that's what this is. And then they're going to have the fashion show. So I'm like, okay, reasonably, you're going to see some school uniforms where she combines some other existing pieces and spruce them up a bit to make something kids would actually wear. No, that's not what you're getting at all. They're like, here are some uniforms for nurses and flight attendants. First of all, what fucking teen nurses and flight attendants do you know of? And then there's a referee that looks like a jester at Renaissance Festival. Well, the way I understood it is that, like, they have to use the shit they have. So they're trying to make uniforms cool by making <laughs> yeah. kids choose to wear them in the real world. So, like, I'm going through my closet and I'm like, yo, I like this bellhop outfit that I'm going to pair <laughs> with these colorful tights or a nice pair of black athletic pants. Like she says in the show, like, and then the ballet slippers. I mean, it's just such weird style choices. And Sue Ellen is like a stylish, like, chick. Like, she wears wears great outfits all throughout there's a lot of pieces she has that look similar to pieces i have in my closet now like she's cool what the fuck is she designing for this company dude as, as horrible as these look on the, the one-off imagine the entire class in that pink spandex like <laughs> mini skirt with the would, diamonds <laughs> you'd look great it would look fantastic big t getting back to your <laughs> shitty mom theory I got to agree with you because say you're this mom. Okay. So you're Mrs. Crandall and you leave your children for two months. When you leave, your house is fucked up. It looks like mm-hmm. shit. You get home. There's a fashion show with lights and catering. The house looks beautiful. How do you know it's not like a surprise welcome home early party for you? Instead, what decision do you make before even looking around? You embarrass your kid who clearly is doing something rad. She's up there on stage with a crowd of fucking fancy dressed people looking at her and you yell at her in front of the whole crowd. You're in big trouble. So you know what? I'm a convert. She is a bad mom. She acts like she walked into a kegger. Like she walked into 50 <laughs> kids ripping bong hits, girls topless, and people fucking in the bushes. She should have walked in, shut her mouth, watched her daughter excel in this presentation, then asked questions. But she coming in like that shows you she's fucking clueless. While apologizing to Rose after the party, Sue Ellen learns that her unique designs had saved GAW. Rose offers Sue Ellen the job as her personal assistant, which she respectfully declines in favor of going to college first. Rose tells Sue Ellen that she can pull some strings, and then they make plans to get together for dinner. Sue Ellen and Brian make up, but they are soon interrupted by Mrs. Crandall, who inquires about Mrs. Sturak's whereabouts. As the credits roll, the scene cuts away to the cemetery, where two morticians look over a gravestone that reads, Nice old lady inside, died of natural causes. So as someone who works in marketing, I've been part of planning large events. And when she does the whole, she kind of, she's got to think on her feet. She's got to come up with the missing money. And she says, oh, you know, banquet halls, they're impersonal. Let, let's just do it at my house. Right in my mind, I'm like, oh, this is such a cute idea a kid would have. Planning a conference or a major event or some kind of an announcement is so much work. As a kid, you would never dream about planning out months or years in advance of a venue and finding all of your, whether it's the catering, whether it's transportation, logistics, the marketing, the layouts, the stuff that goes into an event would not be done in four or five days, but it lets me know that Gaw, regardless, GAW is going to (laughs) fail even with this new line. Gaw. That's their rebranding. We no longer go by G-A-W. We're gaw. Um, I I don't know. I I, I think Sue Ellen's actually really ahead of her time here. I think that banquet halls are killers for social events like this. Like everybody wants that kitschy, like personal touch now. So they're held in homes and they're held in really. And this house is, I mean, she's not lying. Like it's a killer house. Like once they set it up, like they've got like property. I mean, I don't know how a single mom of five kids affords all of that, but I do have to 
say that I agree with you. The timeline, because remember, they're not just playing it. They're also creating an entire fashion line and producing it in this time as well with the one all nighter that they that they pull that they show. And I did have a question, too, about how they paid for it. I mean, because parties like this, I mean, it's going to cost I mean, just like the walkway over the pool alone, like that's going to cost some serious cash. And I know they cut some corners with the baseball team serving. But how did they afford it? Who set it up? How did they get it cleaned up? I had lots of questions. You guys clearly missed the part where Kenny was using coupons. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, that was Where'd it. that block of ice come from? Gosh, they carved it themselves. Yeah, and I'm sure none of the little kid servers or those stoners who are checking in the cars, Valium, said anything inappropriate to these executives. No, it was part of the, it was part of the spirit of the event. Yeah. So, so now let's, let's play this out, right? Mom comes home, she spoils a day, she, let's just say, career cock blocks swell. What happens next? Okay, the next morning, what happens? Because GAW has hired a miner, so that has to be an embarrassment in the industry. People in HR maybe get fired, maybe Rose gets fired. The fashion show, that, that has to ruin their reputation. And then the dead babysitter. What happens the next day? I mean, it's all wrapped up in a neat bow because they hired a minor, which is not illegal. Mm -mm. I mean, you cannot hire a 17 year old. She's already a college. I mean, she's already a high school graduate. Uh, The disaster of the fashion show wasn't really a disaster. The buyers were all very interested. And clearly, as we see in the end scene, the uh, dead babysitter, nobody knows who the fuck she is because there are no police or forensic records or like this woman doesn't have an apartment. She doesn't have family, apparently. Just Sturak is uh, it's actually made up name. She doesn't really exist. She's a Baba Duke. Okay, so how long that absentee mom is back? How long until the property and the house slides back to where it was at the beginning of the film? They've all had a w- awakening. They've all grown <laughs> up and learned together this summer and grown together. And it's not going to happen anymore. Yeah, Belgian waffles, baby. Belgian waffles. Fix everything. I just want to understand Swell's logic here. Because at the end of the movie, she says, I'm not going to take this job with this clothing company. I want to go to design school so I can get a degree so I can get a job at a clothing line. Bitch, you're being offered that job right now at a company that just struck success because of you and your friends with the executive there. Baby, what is you doing? Yeah, but this is the pre-Facebook mentality. Now kids think I don't need college to be successful. Back then it was, oh, if I don't have the college degree, it's going to set me back. She's jumped the line. She's fucking way ahead. If she just said, shut up, I'm going to go work. At the end of the day, kids don't realize your degree, that just opens the door. Your work experience is what gets your career going. It's always hilarious when people go straight from high school to the pros and people are like, well, what about college? You fucking (laughs) idiot. The money you're going to make in one year at the pros, you can pay for college forever. Yes. If you go to college and get injured, you're fucked. How is that even a question? I totally agree. Totally agree. Now is the time in the podcast where we give our chat scores. The wipe score is our way of telling you how many wipes this movie would take to get off your respective butts. Zero wipes is a perfect movie. It's a delicious baked brie from Chef Kenny delivered to you as you're sitting, enjoying a beautiful night by the pool and a wonderful slash horrible fashion show and five wipes is terrible it is a night where you made the mistake of going out with gus the philharmonic and woke up with his sleazeball ass cuddled up next to you big d we'll start with you how many wipes would you give don't tell mom the babysitter's dead so as this movie went on i started out thinking i was gonna hate it and by the end i had completely bought in i was won over by the characters the story again it's ridiculous but we're gauging it on what was it It was a coming-of-age story about how kids would view becoming an adult. And I knew the movie had worked to when the very end came. And I was thinking, wow, what would happen? I totally forgot the babysitter had died. I, I didn't even remember it until we get that kind of end scene that kind of seems added on where we see the two guys who are at the at the plot and the and the tombstone. I thought that was the only mistake in the movie. We didn't need that. It worked out perfectly where the kids go, what about the babysitter? So for that, I am going to give it two wipes. 
I'm going to go with the same score, Big D. I was absolutely cheering for this film until the runway show. At that point, the movie kind of fell apart for me. They neutered Kenny as a character. Uh, everything worked out in like the most implausible way. And I felt like shit didn't get nearly as out of hand as it could have. Like you could have had some real chaos when things started to fall apart. Uh, think of the finale of Animal House, right? Like it's just a zoo in the middle of the street. And the whole movie was set up for that. They had all the pieces in place and they kind of whiffed on that part. But the first hour of the movie, everything up until that part was ultra entertaining. It was quirky and they threw some surprises our way that I did not predict. So for me, it's also a two wipe movie. Yeah, I'm going to make it a perfect three here of two wipes because I completely agree with you guys. I enjoyed this so much more than our last babysitter themed movie, Adventures in Babysitting. I think this is a far superior film. I think Christina Applegate, she's so fantastic. I love her on that show Dead to Me now. And I think that she shows here, you know, those acting chops that she would go on to to kind of just, you know, use throughout all of her her acting gigs post this. And I think not just her, but the entire cast is really charming. I think that as far as like adulting as hard films for teenagers go, this is at the top of the pile. It moved nicely. There wasn't any part where I checked the clock. I thought that the script is really clever and I'll watch it again. I'll show it to my kids. And I, I think I agree with both of you. It falls apart at the fashion show. It's too neat of a wrap up. Um, I think they could have spent a bit more time figuring out the end. But other than that, it's above average. And I'm glad we got a chance to review it. So, Brad, you wrote in about us having wildly different scores on certain ones, and here you got one where we all went with two wipes. So I think if all of us agree, that is an absolute rock-solid score uh, mm -hmm. for Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. So, Big D, with two wipes, where does that put us on the Pantheon of Shad? Uh, so, Gene, with a two-wipe score, that now sits this movie in the 89 spot. It is tied with Pet Cemetery and Tommy Boy. It is slightly better than Crimson Tide, The Sandlot, and Major Leagues, and slightly worse than Beverly Hills Cop, Detroit Rock City, and Starship Troopers. Yeah. That's good company. That's, I that is, great. I think, the mark of a solid movie, especially when you think about, again, this is a movie with Christina Applegate as the lead, and it's from 1991, which is a precarious era for film. Mm -hmm. I think it's really holding its own. Agreed. Yep. Pleasant surprise. System works. All right, Big D, what do we have coming up next week? Uh, so, Gene, next week we have another commission. And as we were talking here about Christina Applegate being gorgeous, this next movie I can remember giving me some tingles in my boy parts. And this tells the story of a government scientist, Xavier Fitch, who intercepts a space transmission containing the genetic sequence for alien life form. He uses it to produce SIL a gorgeous alien-human hybrid. As Fitch's team grows concerned about the rapid rate of growth, Syl wrecks the laboratory and begins a violent quest for a suitable male human to impregnate her. The U.S. government dispatches top assassin Preston Lennox and a team of experts to stop her. It was commissioned by Patrick H., released in 1995. And, whew, I don't remember much about the plot, but I remember a lot about that alien. This is a great movie. My dad is my dad rarely listens to our show because, you know, the movies we do, he's not super interested in, but this will be one that he listens to because this is one of his favorite films. So hey dad. I've never seen it. What? I've never seen it. Oh man. Well, thank you, Patrick, for that commission. Thank you, Brad, for commissioning Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. And thank you, all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us at host at shatthemovies.com. You can support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. You can find all that information by visiting our website, shatthemovies.com. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all that information on our website, shatontv.com. We're everywhere find podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert, Ash Lafley, and The King B, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following sexy movie. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
In January, a message from an extraterrestrial source was picked up at the Parks Observatory in Australia. A new sequence of DNA, friendly instructions on how to combine it with ours. This growth is amazing. The decision was made to terminate the experiment. We have a serious emergency on our hands. I want a team to track her. Hunt her down. You created a monster, now you want us to kill it. We decided to make it female so that it would be more docile and controllable. More docile and controllable. Well, I guess you guys don't get out much. She wants to have a baby. She'll kill anyone that gets in her way. I wouldn't hurt you. Yes, you would. Just don't know it yet. She can have a dozen babies. She can lay a thousand eggs. Something's wrong. 